What the Tech is brought to you by Rocket Loans, part of the Quicken Loans family of companies. Offers personal loans from $2,000 to $35,000 by visiting rocketloans.com slash what the tech. That's rocketloans.com slash what the tech. And by Molecule. For $75 off your first order, visit molecule.com and enter the promo code Andrew. That's M O L E K U L E dot com and the promo code Andrew. Hey everybody, welcome to What the Tech. I'm Andrew Jaren. Of course, I'm joined by Mr. Paul Therod. How you doing, Paul? Pretty good. Pretty good. We um we had some troubles today getting the show started. <laughs> sure. Uh, for whatever reason, the the you know we use VMix call for our end to end, and it just doesn't work for whatever reason. Right. And we tried to incorporate Skype, and then it was a whole different other issue. So I had to kind of figure out a way of muting paul's audio from one thing to get the video on another but he looks good right paul looking you're looking fine you sound good you know given the source material given the source material do. this is a 10 right now yeah. uh guys by the way doing, andrew yeah. before we proceed yes happy birthday ah thank you and you know i got this made today my wife made mm -hmm. this for us i <laughs> Wow. And this is uh this is seltzer and grapefruit juice. It's not there's no sure, vodka. It's not it. a it looks like a cocktail yeah. of some kind. But she made she made this. That's amazing. Yeah. So this is for us today. Uh yeah, 35. I'm uh we've been up there. I'm getting it slowly, little by little. It's happening. You're catching up to me. Yeah. Uh we do have a lot to talk about. You were at Build last week. We didn't get a chance to do the show. I did it with Suncast. Uh wow. but there is a lot. I didn't talk about build. I didn't talk about anything that happened at build. We mm -hmm. did a lot of the Google I.O. stuff, which I do want to talk okay. to you about today. And of yep. course, um a lot of news coming out of the um the OnePlus announcement, which a lot of people right. are very excited about, and I want to talk about that as well. Uh before we continue, I want to thank our friends uh at let's see, Rocket Rocket Loan. There you go. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. It's been one of those days. But you know what? You know what you don't have to worry? When you go to Rocket Loan and you sign up for a small personal loan going anywhere from two thousand to thirty five thousand uh, dollars, you know people build up on their credit cards. The holidays came and went. A lot of people let those charges stay on the credit card and they paid an insane interest fee with them. With Rocket Loan, they make everything very easy. It's simple and secure online process, pre-approved within seconds, no prepayment penalties. You could pay off the loan at any time. So if you Decide this is the month to pay it off. Guess what? You can. It's rocket fast and it's part of a Quicken Loans uh, family of companies. And it's a great for debt consolidation. And if you're planning on doing home improvement, which I, I already did last year, or making a large purchase, this is great. It's a fixed monthly payment and it's a fixed rate. This is a phenomenal service and I encourage you guys to check it out. Go to rocketloans.com slash what the tech. That's rocketloans.com slash what the tech. You can go there, check it out, and sign up. All loans are made by Cross River Bank member FDIC. Uh, let's begin, Paul. Do you want to talk about build first? I want to talk because sure. we didn't. I didn't get a chance to do that. Uh, how was your your trip? <laughs> yeah. Oof. It feels like it was quite a while ago. You know, build is um, like stage two of what for me is probably a four or five stage uh, series of trips, right? That I'm going on this spring for work and for otherwise, and uh, a little tiring, <laughs> you know, so give me a second to reset here and think about that. I went to Vancouver first, so I went to build from there. Uh, it was great. I mean, the interesting thing about build for me this year, I didn't expect to hear a lot about Windows and we, you know, mission accomplished on that one. Um, and, it, you know, a lot of people, I, I don't know if it was for that reason specifically or maybe because it was the lack of like major new announcements or whatever, but... I was kind of surprised by how many people told me they thought that this show was kind of boring. And of course, by that show, what they're really referring to is the keynote, the uh, you know the press event that they have at the beginning. Or yeah. The, you know, the day I got keynote is the right word. Um, that's a little unfair because other companies that have major developer shows like Facebook, um, Apple, 
Google, Google. Yeah. you know, treat this opening keynote as a kind of a consumer event. And they announce new things that have nothing to do with developers, like nothing at all to do with developers, you know. So if you watch Google I.O., and I know you did, you saw a lot of stuff about apps and browsers, blah, 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 nothing to do with developers. Now, there was a ton of stuff about developers at Google I.O. They had a separate developer keynote, in fact. Now, honestly, that was a great show for developers. Uh, but I, th I feel like, you know, Build being the, the Microsoft Stack developer show was a, a great show for Microsoft Stack developers. So obviously today the focus is more on the cloud, and Microsoft has what they now describe as four clouds, which is Azure, Dynamics, Microsoft 365, and gaming. And uh, I think the, you know, the consumer focus, it, it will heat up a little bit as the gaming stuff becomes more cloud focused, but let's face it, it's Microsoft. It's never going to be, you know, kind of a big consumer show. Well, I, I don't, they don't treat it. I mean, have they in the past treated it as a consumer show? Well, maybe it, one it, year. Yeah, no, I, I, they have on and off. I mean, uh, in previous years, we got, we had major Windows 10 announcements that were made at the show. Unfortunately for Microsoft, a lot of those announcements were for uh, products or for, um, you know, apps or services or whatever that they never actually delivered on, which I think has been a little bit of a sore spot for a lot of people. But, you know, the, the, I, I, I give, I mean, I, I feel like I'm alone in this. I mean, because it was really kind of interesting how, how often I heard this and from a very different, uh, diverse group of people. But I feel like if you're a Microsoft developer and you're involved in the Microsoft stack in any, in any way, .NET, whatever it is, and you're using Microsoft languages like C Sharp. And you want to make sure that your career has some kind of a future and that, you know, things are moving forward. I think they've always done a great job with that stuff. And so if you were like a Windows app developer, let's face it, that's not where the hot stuff is happening these yeah. days. But they have solutions for developing using Microsoft Stack technologies on mobile, on IoT, in the cloud. You know, there's there's all this stuff. So you you there's a future. And I don't. I feel like they don't get enough credit for that. They, they, they. It's kind of the no developer left behind mentality. Um, they just don't give up on uh, developers being able to reuse their skills, essentially. So the top. I mean, the biggest thing that I saw that mm -hmm. <laughs> got a lot of non-developer yeah. crossover, which I mm -hmm. was more surprised about than maybe I should have been, was mm -hmm. the uh, terminal. <laughs> Okay, I was I was curious what you were going to say there. Um, yeah, I mean, terminal <laughs> is uh, very much a developer thing, so I don't know why that would get a lot of attention from normal people. Um, it's it's goofy because you know Microsoft or Windows, I should say, has always had these kind of um, low level utilities or low level capabilities that are similar to things you see in the Unix world, and they don't really promote them or talk about them very much. Um, you know, my, they had virtual desktops, for example, for years and years. They just didn't have a way to expose it in the UI. And so, you, you know, third-party applications would let you do that. And obviously, there's been a command line environment in the in the past, uh, uh, not quite 15 years, but certainly, let's say, 10 or 12 years, uh, there's been the Monads, I'm sorry, the, um, uh, the PowerShell stuff, which is kind of like a .NET take on a powerful Unix command line kind of a thing. Um, and then more recently, of course, they have the Windows uh, uh, subsystem for Linux, which brings in the Linux system of your choice, the Linux command line of your choice, the Linux you know command line utilities of your choice. And this new Windows terminal app that you're talking about is essentially the backbone for the what will be the newest versions of all those things. So um, I'm not you know, it, it's <laughs> it's a developer feature for sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I. It's it's a pretty cool developer feature. A mm -hmm. lot of people are very excited for it. Uh, it's, but I, I thought reason. I thought the crossover uh, was interesting. What, what what do you what do you take as the big stories out of here? Yeah. So before oh. I get to that, let me just say real quick. Um, I, there, I think there were three big things on the client. That was one of them. Um, related to that was also that the next version of the Windows subsystem for Linux, WSL two, will actually include an a real Linux kernel in windows for the first time ever it's kind of incredible when you think about it um the current version of that technology uses what is essentially a linux emulator and so now that they're going with a native linux uh kernel of microsoft's uh creation you know they've modified i'm sure an existing kernel um it's going to be dramatic performance improvements especially for disk, disk access which i think is pretty huge um but the the single biggest client side announcement and to, and from from my perspective like the single biggest announcement at the show was actually about Microsoft Edge the new browser the uh, the chromium based version 
of um, of Edge. And so uh, there were a number of announcements around that. But basically what they're talking about is, look, there's this thing called Google Chrome, and everyone loves it, but a lot of people have this fear about Google tracking and so forth. So first thing we're doing is we're stripping out all that stuff. The second thing we're doing is we're giving you, the user, the ability to strip all tracking of all kinds out of the browser if that's what you want. And they have a really simple UI for that, and that's really cool. And then they talked about how they're going to expand from kind of a UX perspective on what Google is doing um, to kind of differentiate their own browser. And also the, the several hundred, I think it's over 400 now, commits that they've made back to Chromium because they're a full-fledged partner in this initiative now. And a lot of the improvements that they're making will be going back to Chromium, which, which means they will impact users of Chrome and of other Chromium-based browsers like Opera and Brave and so forth. So I, I, I thought that was a particularly strong showing. I thought it was great. Um, they're kind of, you know, uh, semi-related to this. And th there's a, it's kind of a controversy that I found myself in last week. I don't know if you caught this on Twitter. Um, but ahead of build or current with build, I can't remember when I wrote it, it must have been ahead of build. I wrote uh, an article about the, the Microsoft Store, which is the app store that's in Windows 10. And I openly wondered whether it had a future. And there were a couple of reasons for this. I mean, a lot of the content that used to be available there is now being taken away. So we don't have music in there anymore. We don't have eBooks anymore. The content that is in there is not particularly popular. Right? We know that the apps and games and stuff that Microsoft sells or gives away through the store are just not used by very many people. And the underlying app platform that they had created for this, which started in Windows 8 and came through to Windows 10 as the universal Windows platform, has failed in the marketplace. Developers have stuck with the technologies they know. Most of those technologies are things that Microsoft considered legacy, meaning they would be deprecated and then just not supported at some point in the future. And as a result, Microsoft has had to change the way that the Microsoft Store worked over time. And so over time, they started adding different app types in. Developers are able to package apps that were originally designed for the desktop, that were designed for the web, that were designed for other mobile platforms, and be able to put them in the store. So it's not all UWP apps anymore. And so in this article, I saw, you know, I basically said, you know, when you look at the changes that Microsoft has made over the past couple of years, but especially this year, what you see is that they're allowing developers of once legacy platforms, meaning things like .NET, Win32, WinForms, uh, WPF, which is the Windows Presentation Foundation, to actually use these APIs and SDKs that were created originally only for UWP. They're essentially taking all the capabilities out of UWP and putting it putting them everywhere else. And so based on that evidence, I had written this in as part of that Microsoft story, uh, Microsoft story story. I wrote that, look, uh, this platform has failed UWP. It's over. It's dead. I didn't actually say it. I didn't say it quite that way, but, and I didn't mean it literally. I meant it like, look, it's obviously Microsoft's going to support it for years to come, but this is not the future. It's not the focus. It was, right? For several years they tried, but developers didn't go along with it, by and large. And they're moving on, you know? Yeah. So you could imagine, Andrew, because you've been on the internet. <laughs> Have that, I? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you've, you might have seen stuff like this. Like, why would you post pictures of your family on Facebook? Like that kind of mentality? How dare you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How yeah. dare you do that? So I heard from people who are invested in UWP because there are people like, of course there are. I mean, there are developers who have made a living off of this or that this is their primary focus well, or whatever. I actually, it, it's funny you bring that up because I mm -hmm. literally, I met a developer over, yeah, it was last week. I met a developer yeah. and he was telling me how this is a, he, even though UWP didn't pick up and mm -hmm. nobody was using it, there were a lot right. of companies paying a lot of money to developers okay. like major companies that were yeah. subbing in like i'm not saying i'll use netflix as an example he told me the company i can't remember what it was but if netflix yeah. now needs a uwp app which they do have a uwp app they yeah, may they not do this internally they're going to hire a separate development team to right. develop a uwp app rather than using their own resources well, so and there's a lot of money in that <laughs> well, so. i know yeah, not for long, reason. Yeah. Um, so consider the alternative to what you just said, because actually that's kind of an interesting story. Um, there's a rival to Netflix called Hulu, right? Now, Hulu um, could do what Netflix did and make a native app for every platform on Earth, I guess, which is one way to do it. But that's very expensive. It's different code bases. It's essentially different apps. You know, ideally what you have is the ability to write like a single app that works everywhere. Now, that's like the dream of Java back in the day. That's the dream today of web apps and so forth. 
Um, it would make a lot more sense for a company like Netflix not to have a UWP app, not to have a, I don't think they have one, but if they had a separate desktop app, a Mac app, a web app, a, you know, mobile apps on every yeah. platform, et cetera, et cetera. It would be better if they had one app. And that's what Hulu did. Hulu used to have a native app. And what they decided to do was go with um, PWA, right, progressive web apps. And so their store, their store app on Windows 10 today is a PWA. And um, how many, how many do you know what number of apps are PWA apps on, on the on the store? No, it, there's it's, no way to it's know. It's very small though, right? It's it wouldn't uh, be. Actually, it's bigger than you might believe, but Microsoft is not allowed to say <laughs> because if you think think about it this way, first of all, um, uh, some. Some companies may want to promote the fact that they're using technology that makes them seem futuristic, right? So a company like Hulu, for some reason, might come out and they might have a press release and say, "Hey, we just redid our whole uh, architecture. We're going full, you know, web app. It's in all the stores. Uh, it works on every platform. It's one code base. We're super futuristic. We're smart. This is what we're doing." They may want to do that, but other companies, for kind of a competitive advantage. Uh, and most companies probably don't want to discuss what they, what technologies they use to develop programs, right? So you, you don't really hear a lot about that. For example, like if um, you know Netflix, for example, Netflix has a UWP app. Um, you, you're not going to find a press release from Netflix probably that says, "Yeah, we wrote it in C sharp. You know, we used Visual Studio. Yeah, <laughs> um, we're using these. You know, like you just there's no reason to just talk about that stuff. Um, but uh, because of all these changes happening at the Microsoft Store and all the changes happening with uh, Microsoft Edge and with web apps and the way that the ways that they're installed, uh, you're actually going to hear companies starting to talk about this soon. So Microsoft basically told me that um, there's a lot more than you think. We're not allowed to promote it. However, these companies are going to be promoting themselves soon, and you're going to be surprised by uh, the size and scope of some of those companies. But the other side to that is, Consider like uh, there's all kinds of companies or services out in the world that would pr not normally create a Windows app because, again, it's like a big investment. There isn't a lot of usage on the Windows side. Not many people use the store. This is not a lot of engagement. But by opening up the store to web apps, right, uh, I, I, there were a couple of examples. I got it. What, Tinder was one and uh, Pinterest was one where they've gone full PWA. So why not just put it in the store? You know, it's yeah. it's like a zero investment, zero um, uh, not investment. You know, zero. It's a zero cost thing for them to do. Like, just put it in the store. It's no big deal. It's just another way for people to get a wrap. You know, it doesn't hurt us any. It doesn't. It might help us. You know, it, it's um, it's almost the opposite approach with uh, what Apple is going to be doing with their store, right? Their Mac store. Well, uh, maybe maybe. I mean, uh, so w I'm I'm curious to see what if anything Apple says about web apps, but I would say that you know. Apple has an incredibly successful mobile platform, right? So opening up those apps to Mac users is a huge advantage to Mac users. It's also a huge advantage to develop. Oh, it's, it's somewhat of an advantage. I mean, the uh, the iOS install base is probably somewhere around a billion users, whatever it is. You know, the Mac OS install base is probably a couple hundred million users. But um, and there'll be issues, of course, when you bring apps across. You know, you probably have to make some changes so that works well on a Mac. But um, you know, having being able to run apps in other places is really uh, helpful, right? And so uh, Google's doing it with Android apps and Chrome OS. Apple's doing it with iOS apps on the Mac. Microsoft is doing it with web apps on Windows, right? And in Microsoft's case, because they have the smaller platform, and I don't mean like, you know, 825 million users on Windows 10, 1.5 billion on Windows total doesn't seem like a small number. But from an engagement perspective, by far the smallest audience. Like, in other words, people actively go into the store to look for apps, blah, 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 whatever. Um, uh, at, developers are not going to target this market, and they certainly haven't adopted UWP. And so when you can open your, your store up to uh, web apps, it just becomes a no-brainer. It's a checkbox. Like, why not just do it? Let's put it in the Windows Store. It doesn't hurt anybody. Um, it, help, it may help us. You know, it's, it's a way to get apps on the platform. Um, but as far as, so anyway, it's a circle back to UWP so I can complete that thought. Sorry. Um, I wrote what I wrote during build and I talked to a lot of people at build. I saw a lot of people. I, I spent an extra day there than I usually do. And, uh, it, specifically so I could interview and talk to people I haven't seen in a while. And then I got home and I got all these people crapping on me on Twitter. UWP, Thoraz says UWP is dead. You should stick to writing about what you know. You're not a developer. You don't know what you're talking about, blah, 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 whatever. 
talked to a really highly placed source at Microsoft who said, hey, uh, I meant to talk to you about this during build. I didn't get the chance, but uh, just so you know, UWP is dead. Microsoft killed UWP. <laughs> it's dead. Yeah, it's yeah. dead. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, is, it is dead. And um, it's, it's literally dead. I, I was saying before it was like, you know, not literally dead, but dead, effectively dead. And he said, no, no, you don't understand. It is, it is dead. And so, you know, in the theme of what I said earlier, which is very true, the no developer left behind thing, that doesn't mean that these people don't have a future. The thing is, this new thing, they're call now they're calling it Windows apps again, right? So Windows apps can be made with any technology that you choose. All of the stuff that used to be specific to UWP is coming to everything else. You'll be able to use whatever you want. You'll be able to target all, all the different kinds of Windows 10 devices, Xboxes, HoloLens, Surface Hub, IoT devices, whatever they are, in addition to PCs, right? Um, this will take a few years. You know, so UWP doesn't go anywhere in the meantime. It may even pick up additional features as they move the platforms forward. Uh, but yeah, it's dead. <laughs> so what it's does dead. this mean for Xbox? Applications um, on Xbox? Nothing. I mean, because the way most, well, most but not all Xbox games are written specifically for that platform, right? They're written to the hardware. Um, the X, you know, games by definition are very low, um, uh, to, you know, close to the metal, so to speak. Um, Microsoft does have a, uh, I always, I never know what the right term is to use, like a set of APIs and SDK, whatever that, uh, developers can use to, um, basically create games that run on cross windows 10 and Xbox. Microsoft is one of the few companies that actually uses this thing. <laughs> so there really aren't, you know, a lot of, there aren't a lot of those, but there are some, um, you know, we'll see, but I, I think, think about it this way because everyone is going to take this in a very negative way. And it, it kind of bothers me because like I said, again, remember the no developer left behind thing. Uh, Microsoft has a present where they are, where things are, they are good, bad or indifferent, whatever it is. They, they kind of have a future they want to get to. Uh, they have some kind of a plan for that. There may be future, you know, there may be a future modern programming environment, which is yet to be named or discussed that will replace UWP and be more broad. I don't, you know, I have no idea. Um, but they will bring everyone forward, right? Whatever the future is, there will always be things for the people who write in .NET languages using .NET style SDKs and APIs, using Visual Studio. There will always be a, a way forward. You know, this is, this is part of the plan. They're not going to leave anyone behind. For a little while, they did leave some people behind. Remember, you know, uh, Win32, .NET, um, well, not .NET specifically, but WPF, WinForums, who said it was all deprecated, yeah. you know? Uh, they were not being advanced, and now they are again. <laughs> you know, they've been open source. What was what was the um, what was the initial reason for them to kind of abandon uh, some of those platforms? I, I, I well, they're not modern. I mean, Win thirty two, for example, is the the C based uh, set of APIs that dates back to nineteen ninety three. When Windows NT, the original version three point one, not, not necessarily Win thirty two, but other other kind of platforms that they had and they supported. Was it just due to legacy reasons, or did they? Yeah, I mean, uh, things advance. Like in other words, the languages, the technologies, uh, everything involved with creating programs that run on Windows advances over time, and things go by the wayside. Like for example, there was a set of technologies that sat between Win thirty two and the .dot net stuff. A lot of people forget about called MFC, which is the Microsoft Foundation classes. It was Microsoft's first stab at object-oriented programming using the C++ language. It was basic. The MFC was basically a um, a set of cla like object-oriented classes that abstracted the Win32 API, so that you could access all of that stuff using C++ and OOP instead of you know uh, traditional uh, like conditional programming or whatever. Um, it was terrible. <laughs> like yeah. it was terrible. So. Um, it was awful. Like I, MSC was a nightmare. Um, there were more sophisticated alternatives from other companies like Borland and so forth, but we don't have to worry about that too much. Uh, MFC is not coming back, right? <laughs> so, you know, C++ developers have things today that they can use if they want to write Windows programs. Uh, MFC is not part of that story. You know, there are other things that kind of went off to the side, like Silverlight or ActiveX back in the day, you know, like these things that were kind of .NET based or .NET ish or whatever they were, but they were, avenues that Microsoft kind of went down and they failed and they kind of come back. Like not everything is coming back, but the way the developer world worked. And if you think about 
the way that Microsoft is today, like is just open to the rest of the world. They can, they see, they know what people are doing. People are using WinForms. They're using WPF. Yeah. They're using .NET. Well, what's old, you know, what's old is new again. And they're going to go where the people are. In this case, the developers. And it, it, this is entirely in, in keeping with the way the entire company works today. Um, and so I, I think, you know, again, people are going to see some of this as negative. I'm going to get shot in the back because I'm the messenger. <laughs> you know, I guess I'm used to that role. I don't know. But um, I, I mean, ultimately, I think they're doing the right thing. Because for several years there, starting with Steven Sanofsky and Windows 8, they didn't do the right thing. They were basically leaving most of their developers in the cold. Yeah. And uh, now they've turned that around. And I think that's smart. That is. Uh, I still want to did, – did you – now, we <laughs> skipped <laughs> over what your Conquered. top – what did, what the top stories out of Build War for you. <laughs> oh, no, no, we didn't. We uh, the, the top one to me was Edge. Yeah. Okay. And the other top two were what you said, Windows Terminal okay. and also uh, the WSL2. I do want to I do want to tell you, I have been using Edge on my Mac. Yeah. And on your Mac. On my Mac. Look at you. I know. I used it for hold on, let me open it up. Uh I've been using it on my Mac uh since last week. And I have to tell you, I it's it's Chrome. <laughs> it's <I> Chrome. <laughs> and you know, here's what here's make why me, it's amazing. Make to me. me Microsoft, make me use this. Just <laughs> make do, you, <laughs> just make me use it. Make this what I want it to be. Make it work. Oh, I and think it, I, by the way, use it. I I believe it will be what you want it to be and what everyone else wants it to be. I I have gone from uh chromium skeptic to chromium, you know, edge advocate. I I I I see the future here because I really do believe that there are a lot of people who think Google is a little sketchy. They're a little tired of the tracking stuff, the weird coincidences. You know, I had a conversation with my wife about a pair of galoshes. And for some reason, mm. those galoshes are being advertised everywhere on the web now, uh, at least when I when I view it. <laughs> and that's weird, right? And I think we have all had those experiences. Um, you know, Edge, the new Edge is going to be the solution to that problem. They're literally going to turn off all that tracking. Yeah, I, I, and I, I want to still provide it. you with everything that's awesome about Chrome, you know? Right now, I mean, this is a very early version of this. And yeah, it doesn't do full sync yet, you know. Um, but, it's, but it's, you know. But it's still, yeah. It's Chrome version 76, right? I know. I, I mean, What's that, amazing about it to me, it's like, Andrew, every single time any browser comes out with a new version, Firefox, Opera, Brave, whatever. When Microsoft came up with a new version of Edge with each version of Windows 10, I would stop using Chrome. I would evaluate that browser. And in some period of time, ranging from seconds or minutes to hours or days, depending on which one we're talking about. Yeah. I'd go back to Chrome. Yeah. And this thing has worked out so well for me. I've not done that. This is a first ever. And I have even installed, you know, brought up new computers and never installed Chrome. In fact, I just installed Chrome on this PC, as you know, because we were trying to get vMix call to work. And I thought at first it might have been my fault. Yeah. No, no, no. It was. Uh, no, no. But uh, I mean, I yeah. literally didn't have Chrome on this computer. And that's uh, interesting. So no, that's fat. It's amazing. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I that has never worked for me. Um, for people who I, who would be normally, I would probably get feedback right now because we're not recording this live. We're recording <laughs> yep. live to tape. Uh, yeah. We, I would normally get a bunch of messages from people saying, "Wait a minute, I can install this on on my Mac." Yes, you can. They, right. you can install this on your Mac if you want to. Uh, mm -hmm. and I've been using it for a week now. Um. Uh, I have not run into a lot of hiccups. I've had some, um, I've had just like small issues, but that could also be the fact that I've, you know, I'm not, I, I, it's a beta uh, and I'm not rebooting properly. It could be a whole lot of stuff, but sure. overall. Which, which one are you using, by the way? Um, the Canary or Canary. The Dev? Yeah. Canary. So Canary is the, gets updated every day. Yeah. And it really does. Um, and, and, you know, for people like us, I think at this time, this that's the one you want because things literally can change every day yeah you know and it, it's, it's kind of interesting to watch solid yeah. it's solid i do want to talk about this a little bit because i do think that mm -hmm. this is a uh this kind of ties in for developing for microsoft because we still don't have a lot of answers oh for some of the questions that are out there yes go ahead paul i'm sorry yeah no, no, I, no. I, there was so much last week i'm it's uh i feel like it, was, it feels like it was a month ago the other part of the story this applies to edge uh, this is an edge type edge adjacent story i guess mm-hmm uh, but it's also a UWP adjacent story. You know, one of the things that Microsoft has found is that mobile app users expect to install apps from a store. 
It's it's the normal way of doing things. That's how we do it. You know, people literally sit there and they browse around the store. Um, what we found is that on desktop systems, Windows and Mac, that, that doesn't work. People just don't use the stores, even though there are some advantages to it. And, and, and you know, I get uh, Adobe Photoshop elements to the store, and I find that to be advantageous for various reasons. But it just hasn't worked out. And so one of the neat new features of the Chromium-based version of Edge, which is available also in Chrome, right, is the ability to install uh, web apps onto your computer as if they were real apps, which they are, but to do it from the browser, not from the store. And also to pin web any web page to your desktop, to your taskbar, to your start menu, and access that like it was an app as well. It's a really cool capability. If you use Chrome, you're probably familiar with it. But because of this kind of divide between the way we do things on the, on the, the PC and the way we do things on uh, mobile, Microsoft is also going to be changing their apps platform so that you can install these apps from outside the store. Because today, it's sort of like on iOS. It's locked into the store. If you want yeah. to get the UWP version of Netflix that you were talking about, for example, the only place you can get that, the only place, is the Microsoft Store inside of Windows 10. But in some time, I don't know, this year, next year, whenever this is happening, um, all of those apps, will uh, the developers will have the option to distribute them to users from the web. Because that's how people on computers expect to install apps now. So that's changing too. And I think that had plays a little bit into the UWP wasn't successful thing. Uh, but it also plays into the Edge thing because hopefully Edge will be the way that you do that. You'll be able to do it with Chrome as well, obviously. Um, but you'll have this notion of um, downloading and installing apps from the web. Uh, and if they're web apps... Or desktop apps, it's you know, it's like the question you asked earlier. Like nobody really needs to know. You don't worry about it. it. It's you see it. It's in your start menu. You run it. It looks like an app. It is an app. Uh, you don't have to worry about where it came from. They just got to get their extensions on uh, on the edge thing. I wanted to tell you before I continue. But they got so, they got they got to up the game with the extensions. So Chrome extensions work. Yeah. Uh, and if you go into uh, you know settings extensions, there's a checkbox on the bottom that says uh, install from third party stores or whatever the thing says. You, are they and planning on to, opening that up? Yeah, it yeah. is. It already is open up. It so is open up. what that means is you can load the Chrome Web Store in there and just load Chrome extensions. Hold on, develop uh, allow extensions from other stores. Okay, allow. There we go. See, and I'm now, learning. Now, I'm learning. So now uh, I wrote an entire series on the new edge. By the way. Um, if you go, if you Google Chrome Web Store, I don't know the address. Um, you can browse the store in Edge, and there you can install go. extensions from there. Got it. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. Very excited for that. Uh, it just shows you, I've been using it very raw without extensions. <laughs> and you know what? I'm going to tell you something. Um, yeah. I don't hate using a browser without a lot of extensions. Right. There's something kind of nice right? about it, right? I, I, you, you kind of realize how bloated the browsers get over time because right now my uh, for chrome well, if i'm looking at my chrome right now i have and and this is i have an ad blocker i right. have an app it's called video download helper which lets mm -hmm. me rip videos from websites because i generally do a lot of editing of, of stuff like that for the wrestling stuff i have an image downloader so it'll sure. just because some websites don't let you download the image which i hate when i'm trying to pull an image yeah um yep. It's a pain in the butt, so I use that. I use Grammarly. I have yeah. um, TubeBuddy, which is for by the, YouTube. By the way, real quick, mm -hmm. this is a tip. If you want to use Grammarly, make sure you use the version from the Chrome Store. Use the Chrome. Okay. Yeah. And then I got like three other apps, and I got a screenshot app. I don't need all these apps. You know? So it just you, it's there. you have special needs uh, in a way, right? Yes, I uh, do, Paul. <laughs> um, both in real life and in the mm -hmm. browser sense. Um uh, for most people, though, one of the interesting things about Edge is that it has built-in functionality that you would need to get extensions for if you were using Chrome. And a good example of that is like the reading mode thing. So if you were looking at an article, it's like the feature in Safari. You wanted to see the article. You don't want all the ads, all the stuff. You click a button in the address bar. It pops up in this beautiful view, and uh, you can read it that way. So that's kind of, Actually, I believe that's coming to Chrome, too, as it turns out. But um, you know, that kind of stuff. I, Microsoft is going to, you know, building in translation capabilities. Um, I'm having a hard time off the top of my head remember what the other stuff is. But there's a list of things that they're adding to the browser that will just be there as native features. Like, you won't have to go find extensions. Well, the um, I think the, the, the text-to-speech, no? Is that it? 
text to speech. Read aloud. Read aloud. Yeah, yeah yep. read aloud. Which yep. I have to tell you, uh, for my father that has a uh, a vision issue, mm -hmm. this would be phenomenal for him. Right. You mm -hmm. know, built built in there, I, and I know I know you could go and get an app, but for a lot of people, yeah. they don't they don't know or they don't want to. Uh, right. I, I kind of like this. All right. It will be built into Windows at one point, right? Yeah. So. For a lot of people, you know, the thing that comes with it is the thing you use. And if it, that thing is something pretty great, all the better. I do have a little issue with mine. It's, mm -hmm. It hangs on checking for updates, and it kind of, like, locks up. Really? Yeah. I've had that happen three times for me. Oh. And then wow. I got to do, like, like a like a real hard shutdown of it, and then it'll yeah. it'll try again. But it's, like, in an endless update for me. Okay. So, that doesn't happen on Windows. Yeah. But... But I'm on a Mac, so there you go. You're on a Mac. Yeah, um, yeah. No, but I mean, that, it would probably get better over time. Yeah, I do. I do want to continue talking. Obviously, we have we have a lot more. I I enjoyed this build conversation because I was holding off on talking about it, uh, and since you were there, uh, who who better than than to talk to you about it? Uh, before we continue, I do want to talk about something else. Uh, I want to talk about Molecule, and the reason why. So I'm big uh, into trying to prevent allergies from ruining my life. Uh, Paul knows this every year. I, I cannot tell you how many times around this time of the year I have to cancel shows because I'm, I'm dying. I, it, it's, it's getting worse and worse for me. So I, a couple months ago, I guess less than a year ago, right? Uh, Molecule came on board to sponsor the show, which I thought, great. It's an air purifier, right? I, and I wasn't familiar with the product as much as uh, some other people were because when I told them that Molecule's advertising, they said, oh, my God, I own one. It's amazing. Now, by the way, to to if you're interested, and I'm going to I'm going to talk about my personal experience here. But if you want seventy five dollars off your first order, go to Molecule dot com and enter the code Andrew at checkout. So this is the cool thing about this. It doesn't use a HIPAA filter. Uh, the HIPAA filter was invented, was developed in the 1940s, and it's been great and it's still used, but it doesn't. It doesn't collect everything that it can. It just collects pl uh, pollutants. Uh, it's an antiquated filter method, but it doesn't destroy it on the molecular level like what Molecule does with theirs. Uh, so viruses, mold, bacteria, uh, volatile organic chemicals, they just go right through a HIPAA filter, and that's a big deal for anybody with allergies or asthma. I have ha I have one in my basement, uh, and it it's totally changed the air quality down there. And I have another one in my living room, and my house is a hundred and nineteen o three. Paul, do the math. It was built in nineteen o three, so <laughs> it's it's very old, hundred and eighteen years old, hundred and whatever. Um, and and it just constantly uh, dusty. So the so one of the, one another company that sent me a product was uh, uh Johnson System Control for their glass thermostat, and this thermostat actually tells you the air quality of your house. If I don't have this thing running, it'll tell me my air quality is poor. And I know that's how it, I kind of could gauge it based on that, but it's also a, a freshness to the air when I have this running. I I'm telling I'm, I become a big advocate of this, uh, of having a, a device like this or, or this device specifically. If you have asthma or you have a house very similar to mine, a friend of mine just ordered two of them. Another person uh, just messaged me that he's ordering one. I'm a big fan of these air purifiers, and I really recommend you check it out. If you are someone like me that has allergies or if you have a house that, you know, it's just your purifier right now, your current air purifier is not doing it, Molecule is an easy way to start, you know, cleaning up the air in your house. Also, it's a very clean and slick design. It actually looks really attractive. Sitting there, it doesn't look like this hunk of junk. Like some of these other air purifiers look like this actually looks like a piece of furniture, uh, a very modern design. It's this beautiful cylinder modern design, uh, and it's and it's great. And if you have pets, if you uh, have allergies, I highly highly recommend. Also, if you have kids, listen, my kids cause a, a mess in this house. <laughs> They're running around more dusted traveling because of the kids and the dog. Highly recommend you check this out. Molecule.com. That's M O L E K U L E dot com. Use the code Andrew at checkout, and you save $75 off your first order. That's $75 off your first order when you visit Molecule.com and you enter the promo code Andrew at checkout. You see I'm passionate about this, Paul? <laughs> you see how excited I get about this? It's because— You're engaged. I, I am. I am because it works. 
It works. I mean, for me, it works. Uh, at times, what I also do, I let this thing travel the house. So if I need to uh, kind of clean up the air in my bedroom or another room in the house, like my office, I bring it there. I let it sit there for a day and I put it in boost mode and that thing just like sucks up everything. It's amazing. Molecule.com slash Andrew. Uh, Molecule.com. I'm sorry. Promo code Andrew at checkout. Yeah, $75 off your first order. Uh, first of uh, many for a lot of people. Uh, let's talk about, I, okay, I want to go through this quick, okay? Old news is boring to people, but this is not going to be a boring conversation. I want to talk about the new, uh, the, the, the lower quality, I guess, the, the less expensive pixel yep. that they released. 400 bucks starting. Yep. You got a big one for, what was it, 549 Four. Uh, 480, I think. Four, 480. Yeah. Very inexpensive. Yeah. Um, I saw that you have a first impressions on Throat.com. Did you receive yours? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Because the first impression said that you didn't have it or you did have it. No, no. I, I, okay. <laughs> so I've written three articles about okay. this week already. Um, I wrote a preview before uh, I had it. I this wrote a one first impressions have. when I got it. And then I wrote a follow up this morning. Because I wanted to discuss a few more things about it. Okay. So last week when I discussed it, and I, and I want to get your opinion of this mm -hmm. phone because I'm very interested in the camera. Yep. yep. Okay. Yep. I, that, that. I, I was talking to Suncast about this, yeah. and I have to tell you, I very weird feedback yeah. regarding this phone. A lot of people, and I got more than one person, said the price doesn't matter. People mm -hmm. don't care. They, nobody buys a phone outright. Nobody's buying the what? phone. People are paying <laughs> okay. a monthly cost, and that's all people care about. So oh, it being way, 400 bucks. Way, sorry, yes. sorry, just to interject, sorry. Yeah. Uh, if you buy this phone, that's probably how you're buying it too. Uh, Google does monthly payments. So yes. you, you probably very few people are spending 500 bucks up front. So, so my response whatever. to a lot of these people, and it was exactly yeah. that, right? Like you don't have to spend the 480. You could mm -hmm. spend uh $20 a month for 2 years. Right? Yep. So now exactly you have to look at it this way. way. Yeah. I, you may not be impacted by that extra $30 it would cost you to get an iPhone or another flagship cuz these these flag it's like $48 uh, 50 a month now you're paying it, for the phone. It depends. Uh, so uh, an iPhone 10R could be had for as little I think it's $32 a month. And so I I guess the, if you are going to spread out the payments, I think the argument there becomes well hold on a second. So 32 versus 20, like, eh, you know, whatever. But you're right. I mean, if you spend $1,000 on a phone, like a, a 10S or whatever, or more, yeah, you could spend 45, 52, whatever, you know, whatever the amount is. That becomes a, that's, it's still, a, you know, affordable in the sense that it's, you know, a, a relatively small payment every month. But yeah, you're talking about a phone that literally is twice as much money. Twice as much money. So yeah. I, I listen, for 20 bucks, if I'm on a budget, which uh, I, I can't imagine most people wouldn't be considering this, uh, mm -hmm. the pricing. $20 for, you know, for this phone compared to if I'm looking at the iPhone XR and that's going to be about $32. You know what? Maybe I'm yeah. going to go with the $20 phone. Maybe I don't want, I don't want to spend $12 extra a month. It doesn't make sense so, for me to do that, which is yeah. understandable. But yeah. I would buy this outright. Yeah, I would too. I would buy this phone outright, and I haven't considered buying a phone outright for quite some time now. I well, am it, considering so, this. Here's what's interesting about this phone to me, uh, because I bought it, right? And what I decided to do is, uh, like, I, I, bought a, I bought a Pixel 3 XL uh, less than a month ago. I don't remember exactly when, sometime in April. And the reason was it was the anniversary of Google Fi, and they had a 50% off sale. And so this thousand dollar phone all of a sudden was five hundred dollars, and I thought to myself, you know what? That's a good At guess. At five hundred bucks, it's a, it's going to be more future proof than this buggy Pixel Two XL I've been using. I can trade in the Pixel Two XL, but I'm not going to do it through Google because I want to get enough money for it. So I bought the phone, and I went to for five hundred. Uh, for five hundred, mm -hmm. I went to Gazelle and I went to Amazon trade in. Found out my phone was worth, uh, let's, I don't remember the exact number, 235 or something. That's tremendous. Like that. <laughs> I and really... I said, well, okay, so yeah, so $265 for a Pixel 3X, it, it was no brainer. 
But but now this other phone has come out, and so the version I bought was the XL. There, there's no models like there's you either get the big one or the small one. There's only 64 gigs of storage, 480 bucks, and I did the trade in on through Google to see what it looked like. It was 275 dollars. Wow. So actually, with a two year old, uh, it's a year and a half year old, a uh, year and a half old phone, two years old, let's call it. Uh, I'm getting 275 bucks. I'm getting this phone for $200. That's not bad. That's that's a no brainer, you know. Yeah. And depending on the phone you have, like like who would who would buy this, right? It might be someone who has an iPhone six series or seven series. Uh, it might be someone who has an older Samsung Galaxy, whatever. If they can get a if you can get a couple hundred bucks on trade in, because right now, like, look, no matter who you're going to, uh, Apple is kind of in, uh, famous for this right now, but. Companies are, at, are giving you more value on trade-in than ever before. And, you know, when you're spending, a, you know, 750 bucks for an iPhone XR or $1,000 for a, an iPhone XS, if you can get a couple hundred bucks, you know, or three, or maybe they, even if they double it, like 400 bucks, you're still paying like 600 bucks for a phone. So it's still kind of a sizable outlay. Yeah. But if you can buy a $400 phone or a $480 phone and get 275 off like I did, 200 bucks? Are you kidding me? So if I, mean, I want to if I want to buy this without a SIM and without service, yeah. how would yep. that go? So I'm gonna this is that, this that's is cool. exactly what I did. Okay, it's so I'm at bucks. I'm at Google site. I want to see how yep. much my Samsung Galaxy S6. You should do it right now. Go I'm to do made it right by now. yeah made by dot google dot com made by dot google dot com. Oops. This is interesting. People might find this interesting to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I th I think it's it's. Uh, no. Yeah, I think I, right. So I'm sorry. I spend a lot of time on this site, unlike everyone else on Earth. It's actually store. <laughs> so like, it's now store.google.com. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then you know, phones three A. Three A. Got it. Yep. Okay. All right. So click buy. Uh, I'm gonna buy. Okay. okay. And pick whichever one. You know, pick the cheap one, I guess. Just to how cheap could you get into this phone? Well, I'm, I gonna, guess. I'm I'm looking at three uh four seventy nine. Go, go the, to town. Get the yeah. well the the Pixel three A XL is four seventy nine. Okay, so I'm there. Yep, okay, so that's it says, what I bought. do I want it unlocked, Verizon or Google Fi? You want it unlocked. Okay. Which color? Let's pick white. Mm -hmm. Okay, trade in your phone. Okay, start the trade-in process. Right. Let's see. It's a Samsung. Uh, will it even come up? Let's see. I hope it does. <laughs> mm -mm -mm, I don't see it coming up. Which ah, one? so I cannot trade in that phone. Which phone? The S6. Oh, the S6. Okay, because mm -hmm. it might be just too old. So in this case, I mean, obviously you could just go to Gazelle or whatever. I could do my S7. My Google, my my S7 is seven. It's like sixty-five bucks. Sixty-five bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So I mean, they probably you give a, you more. If, since you're there, I mean, why don't you take like what is an iPhone seven going for? Let's see, iPhone seven. It's not giving me any options for an iPhone. Just Google devices. Really? Oh, oh, oh. Hold on, I got to go back. I I clicked Samsung. Yeah, Sorry. Think... Apple. Uh, iPhone seven, right? Mm -hmm. iPhone seven plus would be anywhere from ninety eight to two hundred and ninety five dollars. Yeah, and iPhone okay. seven okay. would be one sixty five to two eighty nine. All right, so uh, two hundred bucks is about the midpoint there, right? It's not bad. So iPhone seven is a two and a half year old phone, right? Is that right? Yeah, two and a half years old. Um, that's a tremendous value. And if you got two, if uh, two hundred bucks off, you know, you're talking about getting a brand new phone for two to three hundred dollars. Um, I, I, I just think it's, and by the way, that phone has one of the very best cameras on the market. Um, it's, I, I, I was away last week when they announced this, right? And I read some of the early reviews and I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Like, I, why are these people so positive about this device? Like the last two generations of pixels have had huge reliability problems. The pixel three XL I'm using has, has issues that I don't like, you know, and it's what's really interesting is this phone is better in meaningful ways than the three XL, which by the way costs twice as much. Yeah. And I I'm very close to just using this instead. I really like this phone. It it, it uh, so here's a question. Uh, the camera yeah. on this, on the XL, yep. will be the same camera as the the uh, Pixel three XL? The rear camera is the same. Okay. Um, the front camera is only the base, the, is one of the cameras The on the three XL. And I think on the three, 
there's a second front facing camera that does a super wide mode for selfies, which you might have seen the ads for, you know, the guy holds up his arm and you can't get everyone in and he flips, you know, hits the button and it, you know, kind of goes out widescreen and everyone's in the picture. That's actually pretty useful, but that's not available in the 3A. Um, the other thing that's missing is something called Pixel Visual Core, okay, which is an AI uh, hardware chip that Google made to improve the performance and uh, the quality mm. of photos. Now, according to Google, they've done that in software on the 3A. I have not done enough photo tests to tell you that they're identical or not or whatever. I suspect they're going to be very, very close. Um, it is the same hardware. It's running on a slower chipset, right? So th there's two issues with performance here. Um, one is the chip, right? Snapdragon um, 670 versus 845. And then the second one is the absence of the Pixel Visual Core. Yeah. So from a photographic standpoint, there could be a performance issue that you don't see on the 3XL. I've not experienced it. I mean, I just got it. It's brand new. It, it you know, a brand new phone should run great. But um, but here's what's interesting. The screen is of lower resolution, but I think it looks just as good. It's a thinner device side to side, so it's actually easier to use one-handed mode. It's made out of plastic, not glass. So if you drop it, it's not necessarily going to break. And because it's not made of glass, you don't get that echoey vibration when you play audio through it. The stereo separation is better. The overall sound quality is worse, but not bad. It has a headphone jack. Like, I mean, I, I personally, if I could have, I would have upgraded to 128 gigs of storage. They don't offer that option. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I really like this phone. It's it's kind of messed up. Like, I was I was slightly critical of the early reviews because I was like, these guys have only used this thing for a couple of days. There's no way they can tell how this is going to perform over time. And I can't either, right? I've only had it for a day or day, two days, whatever. Um, but you know what? This phone is excellent. And it's, you know, for people who are Microsoft fans, by the way, um, it, it's an all, it's a unibody, like polycarbonate, like plastic design. It is very reminiscent of some of my favorite Lumia phones from Nokia. It, and what I mean by that is it feels the same when you hold it and it looks the same. It's got that, there's this kind of a look to it. It's, it's, it's really nice. It's a nice, it's a nice device. It doesn't have wireless charging, which I don't use anyway. I don't think most people do. It doesn't have a water resistance rating. Most people don't go swimming with their phone. I don't know. I, for 400 bucks, are you kidding me? Or 275 bucks with a trade in? I, this is, Almost a no-brainer. I, I I need to keep testing it. I, I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but I'm surprised by how much I like it. Yeah, uh, I I'm. This is the first time I've considered buying something out of pocket in a very long time, and I probably will purchase this. Um, as a secondary phone because it's a clean yeah. experience. Listen, well, this the, may by be, the way, the this other... is this may be the the way in. You know, uh, every yeah. everybody's looking at an entry point to to kind of build sure. your customer base. You get them in at this, and the next two purchases, they may upgrade and they may go with a higher version. That's and right. now you lock them in at spending a thousand dollars when yeah, they started maybe. off at five hundred. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we'll see. Like, long term is going to be the key here. You know, the the past two generation of Pixels have had reliability issues, right? We don't know yet. They're so far so good. I mean, thing just came out, but we haven't. You know, Pixel three and Pixel two, when those things came out right away, there were problems. Um, we haven't seen that yet, and so we'll see. But. The other long-term issue is just the performance. Because it has a lower-end chipset, uh, does it degrade over time, right? Uh, is the photo taking – is it going to be one of the situations where you bring the thing up and you hit the camera button and you're like, hello, 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 and then whatever happens goes by and you can't take the picture anymore? Um, obviously, that would be frustrating if there was a performance issue on the camera. So, you know, so far, so good. But it has – I mean, all those cool things you can do with the Pixel 3, like the night sight stuff. yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's all there. I mean, it's, you, there is nothing in this class like the camera that's in this device. Well, listen, it's $349 to get you in, right? That's crazy. Uh, 475, you got the bigger one yeah. you got, you, you got, you know, the whole, is there a camera difference between the pixel three and the XL, a uh, pixel three, a no. XL. Okay. So you could, if you don't care about the size and you're good, right. <laughs> it that's doesn't right. matter. That's right. Yeah. I like that. I, I do. I do too. Yeah. I yeah. think I'll probably order it this week. Uh, before we continue, I do want to talk about the OnePlus 7 announcement from today. 
Yeah. Uh, I do want to remind people, if you enjoy what Paul and I are doing, make sure to fund us on Patreon, patreon.com slash what the tech. You fund us there as little as $1 per episode, and we do a bonus show, which I'm going to try to do something very quick with Paul today. Now that I have him here, I have Paul. I have him in my, in my I can feel him. He's here. Uh, also, I feel you, Paul. Uh, also, <laughs> right. uh, go to therot.com, therot premium to, uh, to join there and become a premium content. Uh, get access to all the premium content uh, that you guys are doing, which I did not realize that you changed your premium page. Mm -hmm. And it is insane. Your premium, insane page. in a good way. Yes, insane in a good way. There's, <laughs> there's a barbecue yeah. happening. Would you like your premium yes. subscription? Well done, which I like. Uh, you yep. could sign up for either a seven dollar a month subscription, and or you could pay for uh, for the year uh, up front. It's forty eight bucks for the first year. Therot.com, <laughs> Therot Premium. Um, let's talk about the OnePlus phone. Okay. Uh, what do you think of it? So it looks awesome. Um. OnePlus has always fascinated me, and their phones. I mean, I, I've God, I've used so many of them. I, I think like three or three T was the first one. Five, five T. It was a five, five and five T. The one, the one, remember. yeah, the one plus one was the first one. No, but that I used. I mean, I'm uh, sorry, I didn't expect you to know which one I used first, uh, but I can't remember if they had the T for each of these, but I think they did. Three T, five T, you know, six and six T, and now the seven Pro in the United States. Um, it, it has. So here's here's what's really fascinating to me. Um, the display is true edge to edge, no, no bezel, no notch. Uh, they have a pop-up camera, right? So that solve that problem for the front. Um, it is an award winning display mate display. They got an A plus rating on every measurement that display mate rates. This is the highest score you can get. They got the single highest score ever on DXO mark for uh, photography. Uh, for the rear camera system, three really? lens camera. Now, that's for photos only. Yeah. If you do the combined score, which photos plus videos plus selfies, they came in second place after the uh, Huawei uh, Mate, no, no, Huawei P30 Pro. And I think the um, Samsung Galaxy uh, 10 5G version. Um, so super good photography, supposedly, although I've already seen one review that said, eh, you know, the photography's not that good. Um, they've improved the in display fingerprint reader to make it faster and also bigger. So it's easier to hit, which I think is important because the old one was, it was okay. Um, but you know, one, one, this company is really fascinating. They always have like really high end specs. So you see like six to 12 gigs of Ram, depending on the model in an age where most smartphones have four gigs of Ram, you know, um, they have 128 to 256 gigs of storage. They have the new type of UFS storage, super fast. It's like up to five times as fast as the previous version that's huge for app loads, game loads, uh, gameplay, et cetera. Stereo speakers for the first time, but inexplicably they didn't have stereo speakers before, and now they do. Dolby Atmos support. Um, you know, beautiful design, obviously. The, so, you know, we'll see. I, I feel like on each of their phones, they have been unique values. They're always very inexpensive compared to true flagships while offering true flagship specifications. And so this is the big difference between, say, the uh, the Pixel 3 X 3a that we were just talking about and the, the super high end of the market, the iPhone XS, the Samsung Galaxy S10, et cetera. So where those phones cost $1,000 to get those specs or more, uh, OnePlus's phones have always costed a uh, cost in the high seven, you know, high hundreds. And so, in this case, if I remember correctly, the the base version, which again is like six gigs of RAM, <laughs> you know, with, yeah. better than any flagship. The base is six. Um, uh, the yeah, hi, yeah, the yeah. high version is twelve. Right. I know it's crazy. Uh, it's like it's a gaming PC. Oh, liquid cool too, right? You know, it's amazing, right? So, um, that device is what was the price? Six six fifty? Is that right? Six fifty um, for the it base. It goes six. Ooh, I have 49. it. Here. I just closed yeah. it too. Oh, look at me go. Uh, six sixty nine yeah, for the 669. base. Six ninety nine for the eight gig, and the yeah. twelve gig is seven forty nine. So seven forty nine. By the way, if you want an iPhone, what that buys you is the base model of the iPhone ten R, which is their cheapest new phone, <laughs> right? Yeah. And which and that thing, you know, we don't know how much RAM it has. Uh, you know, the, uh, Apple doesn't advertise. It's probably three gigs of RAM or four gigs, whatever. Uh, sixty four gigs of storage, right? For that same price, you get like no notch, no bezel, gorgeous display, best display in the market, best camera in the market. You get 12 gigs of RAM 
and you get 256 gigs of storage. It's crazy. Uh, that iPhone doesn't exist, you know, because of the camera, essentially. Um, and because of the notch and because of the bezel and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they are a unique value. Um, I think that I think they are the sweet spot of the market. I need to test this thing first because the camera is a bit of a concern. We'll see how that really is in real life. Um, and they're a little quirky, right? And so depending on where you're coming from, one, one plus is either the greatest thing in the world or they're a little off. Um, I think they're closer to being the greatest thing in the world, but they've always had one or two things per device where you're like, eh, I don't understand. They talk about never settling, but they don't have stereo speakers or they talk about never settling, but you know, they have this huge notch a, a couple of models ago, or they have an in-screen fingerprint reader, which is kind of garbagey when the, the real fingerprint reader on the back was always so awesome. Um, they've always made some curious design choices here and there, but it seems like with this one, they've pretty much done it, you know? Um, so I need, like I said, I need to see it, but based on what I saw from the presentation, I mean, this thing looks amazing. Uh, what, what it actually, the thing that's impressive, uh, the D, D X, Jesus, I can't even say. DxO Mark uh, yep. does has a video of right. uh, their their camera uh, for mm -hmm. for photography and for video, and the bokeh effect looks like one of the best that I've seen. Yeah. Oh, also, I should uh, three. Uh, was it three X? I think it's three X optical zoom, which is okay. You know, the 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 P thirty Pro has five X optical zoom, and they also have a special ten X mode that mixes optical and. Uh, digital to get kind of a hybrid zoom that's supposed to be pretty good although in my you know in you know my experience funny? it's pretty much digital i'm looking at the rating here right on the uh no, dx oh mm -hmm. mark i can't say it for some reason why the samsung galaxy s10 5g i know and the samsung galaxy s10 plus have yep. two different scores is right. the camera different on each one yeah i don't know i would have to assume they are i I did not know this, or maybe I did and I forgot, huh? Yep. Because right now that's a number two camera overall. Yep. Uh, right. It's the number one for selfies, and the Pixel 3 is third. So it's S10 yep. 5G, S10 Plus, and then the Pixel. So and about, the way I would... Uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, I'm no, sorry. go ahead. I, I, you know, low-light photography, they're basically... I don't know about the OnePlus yet, but so far it's uh, the, the P30 Pro. And the Pixel 3s, and actually Pixel 2s as well, because they, they got the software, are all in a class by themselves. They're just fantastic. Um, general photography, I mean, honestly, you can take awesome photos with an iPhone or, you know, whatever. But I would say that there are a, a handful of phones that are just kind of above everything else. It's the Pixels, obviously, the Huawei phones, uh, the latest generation of Samsung. I think we're all right there. And and maybe you, you kind of make a case for the iPhone XS is kind of eking in at the bottom there. But I think they those guys have a lot of work to do. I don't, I, I don't know that you can go wrong with any of these things. What's amazing to me is that the OnePlus, for as good as the OnePlus phones have been, the camera was never anything all that special. It's kind of like any other cell phone camera where like every once in a while you'll take an awesome shot. Like I took a picture of my dog that had like this great background bokeh effect and I was like, hey, this is actually pretty amazing looking. But by and large, I found the, the pictures from the previous two generations of cameras to be, you know, kind of washed out and nothing special. I mean, you watched the thing today, right? You saw the presentation. Yeah. The, the, I mean, the camera looks amazing. Like it looks amazing. Um, so we'll see. I Like again, I, real role, real – uh, real world reviews and t in my case testing are important um so after the show's over i'm going to go see what's available i know cnet and the verge have reviewed it already but the verge said the camera's nothing special so i'm yeah. curious about that uh by the yeah. way a quick update on, on as to why the s10 5g ranks higher than the s10 mm -hmm. plus uh it is a firmware update it's okay. software, and it has um, a TOF sensor, a time of flight sensor, but right. that did not have any impact on the score, according to uh, DxO Mark. Uh, the okay. the reason why the score is different is because it has a firmware, uh, a different firmware at the time of testing, and I guess it and it was all software driven. It was more. So it's possible that the standard S10s will have the same basic. Probably have the same basic. performance now if they get the you know you yeah. get the firmware update. Yeah. Okay. Which is interesting. 
which is great, by yeah. the way, because I, you know, Samsung cameras too. I've always thought are very good, but not excellent. Like not top of chart excellent. It's not and, top of chart excellent to the point that I prefer to use my, um, I prefer to use my iPhone seven camera than I do my S yeah, nine. Wow. Then then okay, using my S nine. Yeah. Yeah, I found yeah S eight and S nine for me were. I, I could kind of see what they were trying to do. And, I, I, you know, I think we had this discussion around like night photo like low light photography. You know, you're in a bar, it's dark, you're taking a picture of your friends. What you want is for that thing to come up lit like it as if with a flash. Most people, that's what they want. Now, if you have a really good low light camera like the one in the Pixels or in the Huawei phones, you take the picture and it's not blown out like light. It's yeah, it's dark, but it's all well defined. and It looks great. It looks normal like it looks nice. But I think with Samsung, you know, they're they're trying to think through like what do normal people want because that's kind of their market, and what they want is something that looks like a flash, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And I, to me, it, I, I don't like it. I, it's too washed out. But I think for most people, like, yeah, that's what I I, I wanted a flash photo without the you know flash effect. <laughs> I want a flash photo, everyone. but don't ruin my photo. Well, it don't ruin my <laughs> eyes. Well, you yeah, doing? you know that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, I, I it's it's kind of a hard thing to explain, yeah. but. Uh, Paul, are you, uh, you're able to do a little bit of a bonus show? Sure. Okay. Sure. Excellent. Excellent. Well, it's going to be about Call of Duty because that's can. what I'm going to be playing. With Actually, <laughs> I was going to talk about, I was going to talk about gaming on, on my, uh, my gaming laptop. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm, I've been playing Street Fighter on this thing every night oh my and my God. wife is losing her mind, <laughs> but I, funny. I'm blown away on how fast this thing is. It's great. Yeah, nice. Uh, I do want to kind of talk about that for a little bit, but okay. uh, other things too. Uh, guys, go to our website, gfknetwork.com, subscribe to the podcast. Hey, uh, also, there was a little iTunes issue, right, where a lot of the people that were subscribed to us are now telling me that they are not subscribed because iTunes did something weird. Uh, hit that subscribe button again. If you are listening to this via YouTube and you also did subscribe at one point, hit the subscribe button, subscribe to the podcast, download the show. The more you download, the better it is for us. Trust me. Also, patreon.com slash what the tech. You could go there and fund us there. Paul and I will be doing a quick uh, couple minutes, 15 minute uh, bonus show now after this and uh, posting it right on patreon.com slash what the tech. And uh, anything coming up with you, Paul? I have all kinds of things coming up. Um, I'm going to be in Miami next week for VMON. Uh, then I'll be home for a week. And then I'm going to the Netherlands for i can't forget the name of the show but it, i guess it doesn't matter since very few of you will be there to see it but <laughs> i'll be there then and then before the middle of june i'm going to washington dc for shift happens shift happens it does shift does happen all the time yeah lots of stuff going lots. on yeah. <laughs> you're very busy uh and you can follow paul at the rod of course and and me at andrew zarian guys uh thanks for watching and uh see you later take care